Hello to all of you. My name is Mark Drumble. I'm a law professor uh, focusing on public international law and transitional justice at Washington and Lee University in the United States. And I'm really honored that the Wayamo Foundation has asked me to offer some thoughts as we move towards uh, International Justice Day. This past year has been one in which I think we have seen violence and violences emerge in the international order that differ very much from the kinds of violence and violences that the International Criminal Court was geared to look at. And here, of course, I'm thinking very actively about coronavirus and the pandemic and the tremendous pain and suffering uncertainty, instability, and in many ways, agony that it has brought towards the entire world population. And to me, this signals, I think, a very important dynamic. And that important dynamic is for a very long time, we have thought about violence and suffering and pain and the globality of it. In many ways, COVID is a global atrocity. And when we think, as we have thought in the past, and right up until now, of atrocity, we have generally framed this within the language of some level of individual intentionality, some level of formulation, of free will, of thoughtfulness that actually leads to thoughtlessness by dint of actual individual action. And as lawyers, of course, we would call this mens rea, some kind of formulating intent. And many of the debates in international criminal law involve the perpetrator and his or her intent. But yet now we face a scourge that is not passed on, passed through, or conveyed through intentionality. The spreading of the coronavirus, by and large, is mandated and facilitated by carelessness, ignorance, inadvertence, selfishness, not extraordinary acts of atrocity, but very ordinary daily acts over which we may not have all that much control. Going to work, standing in a meat abattoir, interfacing with customers, trying to teach and trying to learn, these are the vectors through which these violences spread. And in light of the globality and grand, you know, just the nature of this particular violence, I think it behooves international law and policy to step up. And yet international law and policy has not stepped up. In many ways, the COVID scourge blew the doors off of international institutions, international frameworks, and has resuscitated national borders, national policies, often state, local, subunit, city, municipal policies in ways that we have not seen in my entire lifetime. So what does this suggest for challenges for international law? Because COVID is an injustice and not speaking of it within a framework of justice day, would have far too narrow an understanding of what justice actually means. Well, for me, it suggests that we need to far broaden our horizons to conceptualize what violence is. And at the same time, we need to be modest and engage in some level of reserve and some level of detach from our perspective as international criminal lawyers. But yet to squeeze the transmission of COVID into the framework of international criminal law would be putting a square peg in a round hole, would be broadening the coercive powers of the criminal law to levels that would really over penalize and lead to mass incarceration and mass levels of prosecution. Clearly, this is not a desirable goal. Yet law as it is roots deeply in the adversarialism of the courtroom, right, wrong, proof, and intent. I don't think law is a space 
in which to redress the challenge posed and the pain inflicted by coronavirus. I think on International Justice Day, it behooves us to sit down as international criminal lawyers instead of standing up. We've built an entire apparatus of international justice on the framework of human intentionality rather than the human condition with all of its ambiguities and daily acts. And what I take looking ahead as the greatest challenge for international criminal law in particular is to not always stand up. And what I take as the greatest challenge for international justice is to be conceptualized in a much broader frame, to actively involve conversations about public health, well-being, equality, to also recognize that COVID may very well be connected to climate change in its own way, and climate change itself will produce a tremendous array of security, stability, human rights, and sovereignty challenges. So on this day of international justice, I would urge that we think much more broadly and that in many ways, our role as lawyers in the justice effort becomes smaller and that we welcome a far broader array of expertise. Public health experts, for example, that may be involved in environmental remediation, experts that may be involved in addressing public policies that relate to vaccines, that relate to new technologies. The future of combating violence that our younger generations will have to face will involve far different tools and far different methods and far different skill sets. And instead of us retrenching into a view that the International Criminal Court can end impunity for violence, and instead of placing so much weight and altitudinous expectations upon that particular institution, what I think we ought to do is think twice about the major sources of suffering in the global framework. And that means thinking twice about justice and about our role in it.